nice to um, welcome you all and introduce my, I should introduce myself first. Hi, I am Anne-Troy Johnny. I am the CEO of the Audience Agency and delighted to see you all here today. Um, I, by the way, I am a middle-aged woman, um, white woman, sitting in my living room wearing glasses and currently being attacked by my cat. Apologies, who always comes in just as we're about to start these things. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping before I go on to uh, introduce the session. Um, we're, welcome to Eilish, who is uh, our live transcriber of the day. Now, if you would like to see the transcription, unfortunately, we're having some problems with our link to Zoom. Uh, Eilish will be putting, or and Lou will be putting the uh, link in the chat, so you should be able to get hold of the transcription. Uh, so, as I say, welcome to this first tea break. Uh, the first in a new format for us, um, in which we are hoping to be able to share emerging findings from lots of different kinds of research in a very fast, quick and hopefully relevant format. The idea is that we're going to um, draw findings from uh, across things like the Cultural Participation Monitor, which is our large scale population survey representative of the whole UK population, up to the minute analysis of Audience Finder, this amazing kind of massive national data set that we hold on your behalf, um, as well as a plethora of other uh, primary and desk research that we have available. So what we're going to try and do is to tune in to the issues that we need to uh, focus on at the moment, um, selected partly by what's coming out of the research, partly what's going on in the outside world, but most importantly, what um, people, our colleagues, you, tell us is important and interesting. It's a chance for a really quick conversation, but we hope it can and will lead to other longer ones. So with that in mind, please let me encourage you to use the chat. And um, if you've got questions, suggestions, please put them in there. We will, we're asking everybody just to keep cameras and microphones off at the moment, but um, there'll be a Q&A point uh, later on in the session where we really encourage you to uh, tip up, be present, ask questions and so on. Um, please do introduce yourself, so it's very nice to hear where everybody's at and uh, to see lots of nice friends um, popping up in the chat there as well. Um, because it is the first of a new format, we would be even more grateful than usual if you would share any feedback you have um, for the session uh, afterwards, including any topics that you'd find interesting to look at uh, next. I'm just going to confirm that we are recording the session, as you can see. Um, uh, we're going to record it for use afterwards, uh, but uh, you won't, we, we won't record the chat session, so um, you, you, know, we, we, you won't have to sort of share all of that information as well. Um, I'm now, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Oliver Mantel, who's our Director of Evidence, to introduce some findings, some top-level findings, really, about how place affects engagement and what that means for our practice. So it's a big subject, so it's a, it's a quick overview. So I hope you now have a mug of something nice in your hand, uh, ready to sit back and uh, let this wash over you a little bit and ready to ask some questions and join the conversation. I'm gonna pop my earphones in and go out and have a little walk uh, in the glorious uh, winter sunshine and listen in, in very much in the spirit in which tea breaks are intended. So as I say, please do have fun. Hope this works for you. If it doesn't, tell us what you think, tell us what you want. And by the way, you can book on to the next one, which I think is coming up in February. So uh, welcome, have fun, take care. Ah, thanks, Anne. Um, so yes, so if you like the first little dish in our, our data tapas uh, that we're sharing, um, I'm just going to say a little bit about um, some stuff around local attendance from the Cultural Participation Monitor. Uh, I'm Oliver Mantel, I'm Director of Evidence. Uh, I'm a white uh, bond haired male um, and so I'd just be saying a little bit about sort of local localness um, as that's sort of emerging as a as a theme. Now for many of us um, the idea of audiences largely speaking being local won't be you know, a massive surprise. We normally talk about this kind of 30, 40, 45, uh, mile, uh, 45 minute drive time with maybe 80 percent of people in it. Um, and indeed, if we look at audience finder data, we do see that huge proportions of um, audiences are typically speaking local. Um, so outside London, about 88 percent of um, audiences are from the same region as the, ven as the organization. Um, 75 percent in London, so a little bit lower, but still still high. And obviously there's obvious reasons for that effect. Um, and even where we've done work um, looking at audiences, for example, in Cumbria and Lancaster, um, we've seen sort of two thirds of local bookers um, 
be book us to local audiences being um, local. So even an area like that, which has lots of lots of tourism, um, that effect broadly speaking holds. So we know audiences are local. Um, that's no huge surprise. Um, but we have asked within the cultural participation monitor about people's future expectations and whether they expect to attend more locally in future or indeed less locally. Um, so we said compared to yeah, compared to pre-pandemic, do you expect to attend more or less on a scale of one to five, where three is kind of about the same? Um, we weighted that so that sort of the halfway points get counted half. Um, and broadly speaking, so we asked it for four different types of art forms. And broadly speaking, people are saying that a most people reckon they'll attend about the same. You know, by and large, things don't change. But where people do expect it to change, they're more likely to say they're going to attend more locally rather than less locally in future. Um, I think that ties into what maybe a number of us have experienced uh, during the pandemic, but also it suggests maybe, and there could be lots of different reasons for this we might discuss in a bit, but um, whether it's about sort of new links and relationships formed or people's horizons just getting a bit smaller, there is still this sense that people will sort of keep attending a little more locally in future. Um, so we see here, um, if you just focus in right on the left hand side, the kind of overall figure, um, so this is showing that the proportion of people more who are saying they expect to attend more cl closer rather than further. Um, so it's getting on for sort of eight ish, eight, nine um, percent um, for things like film and live performance. It's a bit less for, for um, indoor galleries and outdoor parks and things like that. So what Anne sometimes talks about is the kind of sitting down art forms as opposed to the other art forms. Um, there is a bit of a split there. Um, so people are saying they're less likely to travel um, as far for sitting down art forms in the future. Um, so there is a bit of an art form difference, um, which obviously will affect some more than others. Um, and it might suggest, for example, that things like flicks in the sticks might you know, be attracting some more people who would otherwise travel a bit further afield to cinemas, perhaps. Um, but also there's a bit of a demographic split. I say a bit, quite a, quite a bit of a demographic split. So the first thing we've got here, um, if we move further along to the right, is looking at audience spectrum, our profiling um, tool that um, many of you will hopefully know. Um, but broadly speaking, it's a range from higher engaged on the left to lower engaged on the right. And we can see pretty much it's those extremes who are saying they're more likely to stay close to home. The middle engaged groups, often with lots of families in them, um, maybe not so much, although that's quite interesting because families actually flips the other way. Um, but broadly speaking, it's the kind of really engaged groups, um, particularly the urban ones, and the lower engaged groups who are saying they may stay close to home. It's also true that younger people particularly expect to stay close to home. Um, uh, disabled people, um, those with young children, particularly the youngest ages of children. So on that far right hand side, that's showing how young the children, yeah, their youngest child is, and it's really under 10, so it's making a big, making a big difference. Um, so broadly speaking, we're seeing those groups are saying they're more likely to attend more locally. Some other groups, there's almost no effect at all. Um, so really, it's, it's, it's those we're, we're really looking at. If we see how that plays out in terms of geography, if it will let me advance it. Um, and surprisingly, if we're talking about it being urban, um, particularly impact, London is the area where there's the biggest kind of suggestion of people staying more local, urban areas in general, but also we look at deprivation, particularly in the um, most deprived quartile um, of, of areas. So again, it's that kind of often those lower engaged groups um, are ones who are less likely to travel. Um, so what does this all mean? I mean, it, it, we don't want to exaggerate it as an effect, but if there is a slight drift towards this more local audience, it could mean that there's um, less spillover for cities, particularly as almost all of these groups I've talked about are the same ones who are reporting being less likely to cut their attendance by as much. So generally speaking, most people are saying they may attend less post-pandemic, but not by as much if they're young, urban, in these highly engaged groups, um, where they have children, etc. It could be that some cities start to, start to behave just a little bit more like a collaboration of villages as opposed to just one single market. Um, it also probably means that um, where you're looking at engaging kind of um, a really full range of, of the population, you need to um, 
really look to your sort of local doorstep audience because those groups we know typically don't travel a lot, but that may become even more pronounced in the future. Um, just responding to a couple of quick questions um, in the chat there. Um, this is from the Population Monitor from November. It's just pre-Omicron, so some things will have changed, but um, I think in terms of the overall shape of the population reaction, I think it probably won't, uh, won't have. Um, and we will share these slides, but also we're going to look to do a more detailed and wider uh, place report uh, in coming weeks. Um, anyway, that's a, a little introduction um, looking at localness um, and how that's shifting. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Elise, um, who's going to look a little bit at rural and urban audiences. So over to you, Elise. Thanks, Oliver. Um, yes, if we, there we go. So as well as, um, just to answer going to question before we start, uh, the exact question on this previous point was um, about whether people expect to attend closer or further from home for those various art forms compared to pre-pandemic levels. That was um, the, the question. Uh, so now on to the difference between rural and urban audiences. So as well as um, the other questions we asked from the participation monitor, we were also able to um, divide our, uh, our population with uh, government's rural urban classification um, tool, which divides England, uh, England only into um, these areas that you see. So in the blue, dark blue and light blue are urban areas. Every other color, green, yellow, red is rural. So we looked at the difference between um, responses and audience, uh, audiences were feeling in those urban areas and then in those rural areas. To start us off, the profile of those areas vary quite a bit. So um, the urban areas are tend to be younger, have higher proportions of younger people, uh, have higher proportions of uh, people with children, um, generally express higher cultural interest and had higher levels of pre-pandemic attendance to arts and culture. Um, again, just for uh, John in the chat, uh, so I didn't include the key, I just didn't want to crowd the slide, but the blue areas are urban and every other color is rural. So green, yellow, red is rural. Um, so those rural areas are less ethnically diverse, tend to be older, uh, tended to had higher proportions who uh, expressed they were conservative as well. Um, lower levels of families. And what this has brought up is that um, because of those differences, it's shown some differences in how they felt about cultural engagement. So in these urban areas, we saw a much um, larger in-person and online cultural engagement throughout the pandemic. Um, they were more likely to say that they had booked ahead in the next few months. This was again, just in November, so just before the Omicron wave, but um, it probably would still be relevant now. And um, also they were saying, uh, when asked about the future, they would be interested in a hybrid offer of having both in-person and online cultural events. In contrast, I, let me, there we go. In contrast uh, rural areas uh, showed lower levels of cultural engagement. Um, except for one category, which was uh, heritage. So historic sites, castles, uh, historic uh, parks, that both outdoors and indoors. Um, and this was mainly driven by younger people and families who are in rural areas, especially very rural areas. They were the ones um, who expressed more interest than in urban areas. Um, they are still at lowering uh, levels of engagement now than they were pre-COVID. But um, even then, there were higher areas, there were higher engagement in for those heritage art forms. Um, and they tend to be, compared to the urban areas, they tend to be more satisfied with what's on offer and with the safety measures um, that, uh, that have been put in place in, at the venues that they did visit during the pandemic. Um, some other notable differences is that rural areas seem to have um, higher concerns about COVID. Uh, they care more about those safety measures. They care uh, more about the longer, the long impact, long-term impact of COVID. Um, 
and um, they're also less interested in this hybrid offer that we saw before, maybe partly because they have engaged less in um, in culture online throughout the pandemic. And again, in contrast, the, there's more confidence in the urban population. Uh, they are ready to attend, they, um, but they obviously still care about safety, both groups do. Um, and the, the, the safety feature and the safety concerns of the rural audience uh, is, uh, yes, thanks for, for posting the notification in the chat. Apologies if that was confusing to use this chat, this, uh, this map. But, um, yes, um, when asked how they felt about COVID risk, very clearly rural audiences felt like they, was, they perceived a higher risk and that they wanted to do more. They, they agreed more with the statement at the bottom um, left here, we could do everything we can to reduce the risk, whereas urban audiences agreed more with um, the alternative statements, we should make some efforts to not go too far. Um, so this was uh, the broad picture that, um, that we saw when comparing audiences from those urban areas, again, the blue ones and the rural areas, the green and red ones. Um, which, of course, uh, gives us an idea that uh, th this will have implications based on where your organization is um, and taking into account what we heard before about audiences expecting to stay more local. Um, obviously, the difference between whether you're based close to these rural or urban, urban audiences could have um, quite a strong impact indeed. Um, so this was uh, some of our findings that we found around place in the participation monitor. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, our colleague, Penny Mills, who will um, give a response on uh, these new findings. Hi, everyone. <coughs> I think you should be able to see me, I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm anyway, I've got red hair and glasses and my hair is scraped back today because um, it's one of those days. Um, I'm, uh, I work for the audience agency. So, I mean, in, in a couple of minutes, I think, you know, there are interesting implications for this sort of changing dynamics and you working within um, cultural organisations and in creativity will be able to tell us um, what you're experiencing. And I suppose the question of whether some of these things will, will evolve and change and revert back to um, what we had before or whether um, some of them will kind of stick, um, I guess, from a cultural organisation's point of view. Um, you know what implications it's having it where you perhaps having closer relationships with local audiences um or you're not getting some of the people who used to kind of travel to you um and thinking about those lower and higher engaged people in terms of what that means um for for your organization in in the area that it's kind of located we know lots of cultural organizations did do some sort of socially engaged work over the last um couple of years and then I guess from an audience point of view, whether some of these kind of polarities that are coming around around age, people with families and not families, people who are in rural areas, people in urban areas, whether those are going to kind of feel um, kind of real. But but it looks like, you know, some habits might be changing and we need to kind of respond. You know, the, the cultural lives of people might be being slightly sort of reshaped in terms of what they're happy to do, what they're, whether, what they're happy to do close to them I guess what's available close to them are they missing out on some art forms that they would like to be doing because they don't want to travel obviously there's that kind of question around urban of whether people are bringing in more kind of digital we know people's habits are changing and that they're working from home so there's a suggestion about when you know are they available more in the week or are they going to um, uh, engage more at the, at the weekend and I think from this kind of rural point of view there's a real um, challenge um you know where if you're thinking about places that don't have so much cultural or creative opportunity where people perhaps have done some things but um, um or don't know don't feel that they want to any longer but where there is a local art center what are they doing or where there are opportunities um around um touring and things and it strikes me that um if any any cultural organization do anything that idea of um, making links with heritage seems to be um, quite a sort of strong um, um, card on these things. Um, 
so I, th I think there's much to kind of talk about um, from that point of view. So it'd be great to think of those kind of different perspectives. And I think I am now handing over to either Ollie or um, Patrick, who's going to give us an example. Of I think you're handing back to me. Ollie, sorry. Yes, there you go. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so th thanks, Penny. Um, so clearly there we've given something of, a, of a, a brisk run through of a couple of different things and I will try to respond to some questions in the chat there um, and obviously Penny's given some thoughts as well but um, is there anything that any of you would like to reflect on in terms of what you've heard um, whether it's say maybe, maybe matches your experience or how you how you have seen or how you expect things to go perhaps um, I mean is that matching whether either as your organization or just your personal experience um, so, for example, from my point of view, uh, living in Sheffield, I'm really conscious of the, you know, the importance of local communities to a greater extent and um, you know, attending things more locally than maybe I would have done. Um, so if anyone wants to say anything about that, that would be really interesting. Um, do you see these trends carrying on, maybe? Or is there work you've done during COVID that you think may have affected which communities you're engaging with? Um, so if, I don't know if anyone would like to um, the hand up um, to come to the mic to speak, that would be really interesting to hear from hear from someone. Um, just seeing there's a comment from Megan there, perhaps. Um, Hang on. Um, hi there. Hi. I don't know if anyone can see me, if you can see me. Um, yeah, so I'm in Bromley, which is uh, technically South East London, but also sort of Kent. Um, and for us, it's kind of been led, we've noticed it more in terms of the type of show. So we're a theatre, we put on um, receiving shows rather than producing our own work. And we have definitely seen a shift to a slightly more younger audience. We used to predominantly be an older audience, um, quite white, middle class, 50 and up. Um, there are still some of those people coming, but we've definitely noticed that a move away from that. Um, and the shows that tend to attract those audiences are perhaps struggling a little bit more. Um, than they would have done pre-pandemic, um, whilst things like Six completely sold out and those kind of big name shows in theatre that have a following have still managed to do okay. Priscilla, we sold really well. Chicago, we almost sold out the entire run. Those kind of big name shows are still managed to draw people in. We had a little bit of a lull, it'd be interesting to hear from other people, a little bit of a lull over December because the kind of ambiguity about Omicron and what was going on with that. Um, but I've definitely seen a lift in sales in this early part of January once it became clear we weren't going, hopefully, into a lockdown again. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we've been. Um, I find this really interesting, like I said in the chat, because we're close to kind of Greenwich and Lewisham and moving further, in, further into urban areas, but also you go south out of Bromley and you kind of have a more, not full on countryside, but certainly more, what you would consider more white conservative rural areas. We hit both. Um, so this data has just been really interesting because we kind of sit somewhere in the middle basically. But yeah, that's our feedback so far. Wow, thank you. Um... So yeah, it'll be interesting to see straddling those two whether you, know, you see different bits of this playing out um, in one in one in one way or the other. Um, is there anyone else who had any um, any any reflections they wanted to um, to raise or further questions they wanted to ask? Maybe. Um, I mean that that thing about the very different feel of the audience reaction as you move between two places, I think, is quite interesting. Um, it certainly felt sometimes, um, you know, within the agency, obviously we got staff around, based around the country and sometimes we have conversations and what's happening locally has felt very different at different points. Uh, and that thing about, you know, London having sort of opened up much earlier. Do we know how long people will feel like this for? Um, that's a great question, isn't it? Um, I think it's, um, it's a real challenge. One of the things we're doing in the process of tracking monitors, trying to see those shifts of sentiment um, we've been really surprised to see how slow people have been to change how they felt. Um, and it, it feels that people have kind of been rewiring their, what they feel about attending on quite a basic level, which is therefore then quite hard to move. Um, which doesn't mean to say that once it does start moving, it'll move quickly. I mean, hopefully, hopefully it will. Um, 
So um, the question about how it gathers uh, how we gather data, it's through an online panel survey, um, which we've set quotas on to make sure that um, it's representative of the whole population, whether by region, um, by ethnicity, by age, um, and so forth. Uh, apparently, we have a hand up, Lee Johnson. Um, hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, hello. Um, so I run a venue in Norwich called The Halls, and uh, this is the first time I've been to one of these. Um, so thanks very much for uh, the the invite. Um, just uh, to touch on what Megan was saying, um, I had a, a brief conversation with um, a chap called Richard, who's the program manager at uh, St George's Hall up in Bradford, mm -hmm. um, and we were um just talking and he was saying that you know within half an hour's drive he's got something like a population of 4.6 million people mm -hmm. in norwich right in the middle of norfolk we've got um a population of about 600 um, well norwich itself is about 150,000. the county itself is about uh 600 000. um so we we're, we're quite um unfortunate in the in the sense that there isn't um you know we, we, we don't have another city close by or another big town close by um for, for people so the 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 city of norwich is quite saturated really for um art and culture um so we're all kind of you know vying for this, this similar sort of shows etc cetera, etc cetera. anyway um but it was just interesting what megan said about how you've got kind of giant city on one side and then countryside on the other we're countryside all, all around um anyway um one thing that um has kind of really dawned on me was there was this massive rush before christmas this massive panic of cancelling shows are people going to come out are people not going to come out and since the beginning of of the year uh, it might be that i mean generally we're quite dark at the moment anyway but i'm getting a feeling that omicron is just there and people are going to be coming out come what may and i'd like to know whether that is the feeling from other people in this room or if there is still a big massive concern around omicron and how is it going to affect um, your audiences as we go forward fantastic great question um does anyone want to maybe comment on that in the chat and how that how things are going for them or not anyone else want to say anything about that because i think I guess that's the moment we're kind of in some ways waiting for isn't it they kind of people start to be more confident regardless um i don't know does anyone have any reflections um i mean i'm not speaking personally for the venue here but more just from because i kind of work in the pr side of theater so i have to kind of keep on top of what the industry is like i think it's more coming from the producing side a little bit at the moment um with tours being pulled um so uh there was one that was that friends that had to be postponed that i saw and um one to bring it on these are all very commercial pieces of theater and i'm conscious that not everyone sits in commercial theater like i do but because there was a, a short period over december where people either didn't want to come or couldn't come because they were isolating and the financial impact that had on producers that then made them wary to tour into 2022 and again this isn't from any personal venue perspective it's just the sense I'm getting across the industry at large in commercial theatre because this announcements keep coming out about these types of things um so whether or not actually the customers feel that way is almost they're sometimes being put in that position because of what's going on at large in the industry um, but that's just commercial theatre. I mean, other aspects of the art might be different. Interesting. Thank you. And is there is there anyone else that would um, have a different view on that? Ah, yeah, the WNO um, is picking up. That's lovely to hear. People who like shopping are people see out and about. Yes, that's probably true. So yes, so Stephen said, um, the cultural audience are more cautious about returning to busy urban areas and spaces. The retail sector will have a different experience for different retail outlets. Yes, and we're certainly seeing a, a real segmentation um, in attitudes and behaviours. Um, and Hampshire, that's great. 
Um, Thanos from the National. Um, do you have a, a reflection? Yes, hi. Uh, we, we've also, I agree with several who has put in the chat that sales have uh, picked up this week. They have. But what we have noticed since we reopened is that people are not willing to book far ahead uh, for shows that will be you know, in May or June. We see that the sales there are still very, very low, especially from our members who skew older and tend to buy about 30% of the tickets we sell in a year. At the moment, their engagement is on 15%. So they're definitely not ready to come back yet. Right. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time. Um, so shall we pass over to uh, our colleague Patrick just to talk about a, a particular um, project he's worked on? Um, but then maybe there's more of a chance for chat if people want to stay um, and talk more later. Um, and yes, good point there from Megan. Um, it's all about risk as well, isn't it? Um, Patrick, do you want to tell us a bit about um, Plymouth and the work you've been doing there? Sure. Um, hopefully I've got control of the slides and I'm appearing here. So I'm, uh, well, yes, I'm feeling very middle-aged. I've got mad professor hair and glasses and a goatee and a bright orange picture behind me, my cat. I don't know where the cat's gone. Um, but uh, I just wanted to share some work that we did with the uh, knowledge transfer bit of the University of Plymouth. For those of you who don't know, uh, knowledge transfer is the kind of bits that are trying to work with businesses to commercialise what the university does, but also to work with um, the arts and cultural heritage and other social enterprise sectors to do more kind of applied research. And it's is part of uh, the reason why it's in this um, session is it's, it's about universities operating in their place. And I think you'll see a general trend to all of them, um, not just over the last two years because of COVID, but it's kind of wider policy and strategy move to be more embedded in their local communities. Um, uh, uh, we could have spent the whole project trying to work out what the immersive sector was, but we just picked a definition and went with it and everyone seemed to be happy. You'll probably all know about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, um, but there's also 360 degree video. And in fact, one of the things that prompted this project is Rio, um, the arts organization in, across Cornwall, uh, took on a, a residency in the Market Hall, uh, which had Heritage Fund um, uh, money to be totally redeveloped. And part of that, it has the state of the art, like the like the, the highest spec in the world dome that's a projection dome that you know you might have um looked at uh, the stars at night or something like that but it can project all kinds of things so that's what immersive means the immersive ecosystem well what that might might that be that that could be commercial businesses but it could also be social enterprises and plymouth as, a, as an area has got many many different sectors you see them down the left hand side here arts and entertainment and recreation are are an important part. Obviously, it has a tourism um, sector, as Penny was talking about earlier. Um, <clears throat> also, there's um, uh, quite a few universities and other higher education institutions in Plymouth. So there's the Plymouth College of Art as well as the university. But uh, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, there's a, also a whole range across the southwest, and they they tend to collaborate. As Elise was saying about um, rural areas, one of the things that happens in in those is that the creative and cultural sectors tend to work more closely together because there isn't a critical mass of any one particular say heritage or tv or or performing arts sector so they actually do tend to collaborate more this is just a kind of mapping which shows content and experience uh, uh, as a particular kind of immersive offer being used by a range of the industries that are nearby um, one of the whole things around creative industries and, and cultural sector is uh, around this idea of clusters and um, uh, clusters has been an idea of that interconnecting all those different bits arts culture heritage digital including immersive but it might be design and media and things like that and then looking at the kind of assets so this is i don't know how well you know plymouth but this this is the city center so this is looking at the kind of assets that are available there's there's stuff that's to do with the marine sector health and well-being as well as lots of creative cultural visitor economy things as well um and then uh, if you zoom out 
uh, Plymouth is, is and the River Tamar is the kind of bit where it says 11. And so this is the area around Plymouth. And this kind of shows how the immersive uh, sector is, is uh, populated there. And then the final thing that we, we actually um, wrote, it, which is about to be published by the university, is a prospectus. So basically, this is something which says, look, if all of the people in the sector, arts, culture, heritage, for-profit businesses, investors, uh, the, the city council, the universities, if they all work together, and particularly as we show in this map, if there's a more of a kind of flow from Falmouth to Plymouth, towards Exeter, perhaps to Bristol and Cardiff and beyond, then there could actually be a, a creative and commercial immersive uh, uh, corridor here. Interesting point all the way through the role of arts, performing arts, visual arts, artists, creatives in driving innovation in the immersive sector. I, I know I need to stick to my time, so that's all I'll say at this point. Ah, thank you, Patrick. Um, and hopefully that and the last toggling of scale there also shows that you know when we're talking about place there's you know very you know this hyper local and there's much much wider any of which we could get into in in much more in much more detail um just before we open it up for any other reflections and questions um just to flag that we're um looking to have another one of these next month um looking at what we've termed contemporary art forms so things like contemporary classical contemporary visual arts contemporary music um contemporary dance um, so do please join us for that, um, and we'll share a link to that 